Hi, everybody. Uh, in Malaysia, we call it Selamat Datang for those who are in Malaysia. A uh, very blessed morning uh, and also a very interesting uh, opening uh, talk by Bishop. And uh, I will take you through the topic which is given to me as the education system innovation, a global approach. Okay, um, let's first look at how many of us here, can you just put up your hand, who are educators or teachers? Can you just put up your hand? Educators, teachers, yeah, okay. Now, I have to tell you, it's, it's good that some of you are here and uh, I'll just take you through a little bit of this noble profession that we do here and how philanthropy actually kicks in, yeah? Now, um, first and foremost, um, a little bit background about St. John's International School. Uh, it was established in 2010 uh, in collaboration with the De La Salle Christian Brothers of Malaysia and uh, it became the first uh, mission private school, Christian Brothers School in Malaysia. And it also became the first co-ed school in Malaysia. And it started nine years ago. The first cohort of students who came to our school, St. John's International School, there were five students we started with. And today, uh, there are 720 students in my school. And this uh, growth has happened a little bit also because of uh, the grace of philanthropy as well in the hearts of our parents, our students, and also the stakeholders. Yeah? So I'll take you through that. Now, um, we all know, just before uh, I start my slide, the uh, school, the St. John's International School takes a lot of activities. We involve our kids in many activities. And as we know, the landscape of education has changed throughout the years. Yeah? Uh, from the days that I was a teacher back in a very rural place, uh, I remember when I started as a teacher and when I was 21 years old, I was uh, posted to a very rural school in East Malaysia. And uh, I used to go to a school, which was, uh, we call it the Orang Asli School, which is an indigenous native school. And I used to take a boat five miles down the river and walk another about a kilometer to the school. And it had only about 300 students. And I had a shock of my life because the school that existed for 30 years, they did not ever had a sports. They never had sports day. So after 30 years, we young teachers who were there started sports. And it was amazing to see how these students became district and state runners in the years to come. So I'm saying this because the future is in the hands of our children. And if we do not empower them, and if we do not invest in them, then our future will seek bleak. So this is why innovation in education is very relevant and important. So now, I remember that education, as I was saying just now, um, education's landscape has changed tremendously. Uh, there is a saying, can you take the teacher as a sage from center stage and put him on the sideline as a referee? I don't think you can do that. But there have been numerous attempts to do that. Why? The, because of the arrival of technology. The technological tools that are now being brought into classroom may seem to take the place of the teachers, but actually it's not. So this is need to be treaded very carefully, because if not, 
uh, I would not see many hands today popping up as educators. Uh, they will be sitting on our table as smartphones and devices and laptops. Okay? So, let me also tell you that the landscape in education has changed and it's now become very confusing because there are more programs now in the market than that is left for the choice of the young and the teenager and those who are going to the university. It's rather confusing. Just to give you a picture, uh, about 20, 25 or 30 years ago, uh, this is irrelevant to my experience. We did not have a supermarket or hypermarket those days. We had a mini market, yeah? Now, if one goes to a mini market, and I remember my dad used to bring us to the mini market, and he used to, you know, as kids, we would be running around, yeah? So to just to get us out of the supermarket as soon as possible, he would tell us to go and grab a chocolate and come back to the counter so he can buy his groceries, groceries and off he goes out of the mini market. And sure enough, my, uh, my siblings and myself will be at the counter within a minute and cash says it, cashier pays, takes it and we walk out. But I think today if you were to ask your children to go to a supermarket today or a hypermarket and ask them to pick up a chocolate to come back to the counter, I think you would be spending an hour looking for them. The reason is they would not come back to the counter because they'll be standing in front of the chocolates and trying to think what brand to take. Because you have numerous brands of chocolate today. Those days in Malaysia, we only had three brands. Cadbury, Van Houten, and Candles, only three brands, so it was easy to pick. Today, there are so many brands, and we are even confused. Even kids today, today are confused whether the chocolate will taste better than the packaging. <laughs> right? So we know that. And can you imagine the prices of chocolate today? We have Belgian chocolate that almost goes for 200 a box. And those days, it was very cheap. So, likewise with education, it has, it has changed. Uh, we talk about quality, we talk about what's good. There's so many programs out there, and it's become more confusing for our students. Not only in Malaysia, but also globally, yeah? So, giving the right education becomes pertinent to our kids, because they are the future. Okay, let's start now, uh, very quickly. What is innovation? We have talked about innovation. So what is actually innovation? Uh, people say it's a change. But what actually involves in innovation, sorry, what actually involves in innovation it must be fundamentally, it's doing things in a different way or different method. It can't be the same, then you don't call it innovation, yeah? So, if you're doing old things now, the same things that you've been doing a couple of years ago, and there's no change, then there's no innovation, yeah? And innovation starts first here. Okay, before we put it to action.
convent schools. And this convent school flourished throughout Europe and came to the shores of Southeast Asia. And today, we have so many schools in Malaysia and so many schools in Southeast Asia which are convent schools by the IJ sisters, the Infant Jesus sisters. And we have so many other orders, the Maris brothers and so forth in, in, in Philippines and, and also in, uh, in Sabah and Sarawak, our East Malaysia states. Now, De La Salle, ethos and spirit is one thing that we have in our school. Our school culture in St. John's International School based on four pillars. This is also part of our way of showing the philanthropy aspect of the school. First thing that we say is, the first pillar is that anybody who comes into our school, St. John's International School, must have two characters. That is, they should love and enjoy their school. It doesn't matter if you're a student or a staff. If you don't love and enjoy what you're doing, how can you improve? How can you respect others? So this is the first thing we teach our kids, that you, do, you are now coming from a different culture. They may come from a different kindergarten or different primary schools, and they come on to the secondary school in our school. And we teach them, first of all, to respect themselves, to respect others, respect their teachers, respect their communities, respect their family. Because, as we say, everything starts from home. And then it's extended to the school. There is a tripartite agreement between the student, the teacher, and the parent. Without these three parties involved, there can never be education. If you are going to be a school that only teaches students, not their parents, then you're not a school. To me, you're not a school. Because a school's duty is to teach the community as well, to lead the community as well. And today what we have is, we have so many schools that have become so commercialized. Very commercialized, I should say. It's a sad thing, but it's a business already. And that is why we took a stand very early on when we worked with the De La Salle Brothers of Malaysia, that our fees, even though it's a private school, will be the most affordable. And today in Malaysia, there are 152 international schools and growing. And if you look at the fees range from the top, there is a school in Malaysia that charges 58,000 for year one student, prim primary one, boarding and all. As you go down the rank from the highest to the lowest, today I, am, I would proudly tell you that St. John's International School is below the 15 rank of affordable schools. People say your school is cheap, uh, uh, you know, this is the language they will use because, as I said, Malaysians are very good in shopping, so discounts, you know, cheap, everything. But in education, you can't use that word. So we make our schools very affordable and we ensure that the four pillars are introduced to them. So just now, as I said, the first pillar is love and enjoyment. So even our staff. The second pillar is the school's responsibility is to build character in the students. Without a character, you have no career. No organization will ever employ you. You can become a great accountant, but you can steal from your company. You can become a great lawyer, and you can lie your way out in court. Okay, you can be a great doctor and charge your patient the most amount of money for the tiny surgery that you're going to perform. And you will actually reap all their financial resources from a particular family. Now, if these are the ethics that we are going to be practicing out there, then this is something is wrong with our schooling. Something is wrong with our schools. So, character building becomes a paramount factor in the way we change our kids when they come to school. Because as a parent, you would want your child to be somebody who is useful first to themselves, to their family, 
then to the community, then to the society, to the country and globally, as a global citizen. This is what every school's aspiration should be. Because you're building this character in them, okay? The third pillar that we say is, and this is very true, the 21st century student of today cannot be successful if they know only a monolingual language or two languages. You must know more than three languages. If you know more than three languages, you become almost half the global citizen of the world. And the more language that you speak, the more global, the more networking that you can do. Can you imagine if you are a non-speaking Mandarin person and you're going to China to do business and you have just got your first assignment and there is a meeting going on and you break the whole scenario with your welcoming with your Mandarin language because you know Mandarin. Or if you go to India and you break the whole meeting with your Hindi. Or if you come to Malaysia and you speak or in Brunei, you speak in Malay. You break the ice and you, bring, and you build your friendship. You build your goodwill. Most successful people today in organizations are people who work on goodwill, friendship and network. These are the keys. So learning language becomes a key factor in any school. This year, we have reintroduced French in our school. In the next year, we are introducing German. We have already used Mandarin from the time we started our school. So most of the students who come from Chinese independent school, they stay on with Mandarin. So there are three languages by 2020 we will have. And hopefully, we will start a department of languages. So there will be more languages to be introduced. Yeah? And the last and the, but the fourth pillar in our school is that the ethos and the spirit of the LaSalle the empathy and the sympathy of giving to others. You must be charitable. In order to learn, in order to educate yourself, as what was said just now by, by Bishop is, you can't just talk. If you are an educated person and you do not share your knowledge, you are nothing more than a library. Yeah. We all know there are libraries, but the library's books are there. No one is picking it up and, and reading it. But if you share and put what you have learned into action, then you have become an educated person. I will give you an example. If you walk down the street and you pass a hawker selling some fruits and a PhD holder from a good university comes down and he buys a piece of fruit, eats the fruit and take the packaging, a plastic paper, plastic wrapper and just throws it down and walks away. The hawker looks at it and he picks it up and puts it into the dustbin. The question to be asked now, who is more educated? Is a person who went to the university, who got a PhD, but the very basic of cleanliness who has been taught to him since he was in primary school, he did not put into action, is that what education is all about? Or is that the hawker who is doing just a menial job, but he knows the sense of responsibility of keeping his environment clean? So you see what I'm trying to tell you is, you can have the best teachers in the world to teach in the best universities or schools, but you would never produce the best students in the world. The best students are produced by people who make them think and also who put their thinking into action. So we do that through schools. If we teach our kids to be charitable, it's just a word. What's charity? What's caritas, right? What is charity? Charity must be seen to be done. So we empower our kids to go to orphanages nursing homes, um, special needs homes, 
or we go to, uh, we do projects, activities to raise fun, to be philanthropy in their sense of their thinking. If you're going to help an, a home, does it come from your pocket or does it come from the community? How are you going to carry out the project? We should teach them to do this. We should empower them how to get there. So we need schools to do that through the clubs, through the sports activities. So this, these are all stress releases for our kids. If you ask me to be the 21st century student today, as a 21st century student today, I'll run away. I'll find a cave to hide because the 21st century student, the students today in many of the schools are undergoing a lot of stress. I'm telling you this, there are students, I know my friends in Singapore, who can't even speak to their kids. When I go and visit them, my primary aim is actually go around and meet my relatives and friends, then I become a counsellor, you know. I sit down and talk to their kids. And I ask them, why? Haven't you talked to your kids? I can't get through them. They just can't get through their kids. Because when they become teenagers, the moment you stress, well, I'm 18, I'm going to leave home. So this is a frightening thing that's happening. What more with the technology in their hands? This is more frightening. That's why if you want me to go back to school today, I'll run the other way. <laughs> okay? Because I had a very good uh, time in my school. My father was a principal in school and I was the only one who was caned by my dad because I was a mischievous kid those days. And you know what they did to me? In order to make sure that I had some responsibility, they made me the prefect. <laughs> they made me a prefect so I would be empowered to, to know what my laws are in school, regulations in school. So these are things that we need to make sure our kids are empowered with charitable attitudes, philanthropical attitudes and elements, not just saying by words, but putting that into actions through club activities, yeah? So the branding of the school is important because this is how you brand them. You must know what's your best, best, best practice, system mind change. This is the most difficult thing to do. I can tell you, if you're in any organization, the most difficult thing to actually manage is people, humans. You can manage your phone and a fax machine or your computers, but to manage someone, oh my God, I wish I had a remote like this, just off them and on them, you know, but you can't, yeah? So how do you empower them? As I said, you have to work on their emo, emotional intelligence, because nothing else will work. The way I talk to my kids in my school is different. I will tell them why smartphones can't be used during instructional periods or instructional lesson time. They are only allowed to be used during their breaks. I have to tell them why. I cannot say, don't use it, and that's it, period. I can't do that. I have to tell them the rationale. Why? So if you tell the kids rationale and tell them if something goes wrong. Okay, by the way, do you know what's the age limit for being a Facebook account holder? Do you all know? What's the age for being, to have an account in Facebook? What's the minimum age? Yeah? Thirteen. One, three. If you're below thirteen, you can't have, but you know, right? Even an eight-year-old have an account today. How does that happen? Because they falsify information. They put false information. They put their brothers or their uncles or their aunties' information there, and they can play around with their age. It's all in the in the in their system. So you can you can do uh, all kind of thing with the system. But we tell them, what happens when you get into trouble? You are underage. Your dolly in capex. 
you can't be produced in court or nor be sent to prison. Who gets the brunt of it? The parents, the adults. So if you were to tell them the reaction and the effect of using it or abusing it, then you work on their emo. Then you channel their thoughts and everything to more useful and positive sense. So charity, activities, being philanthropic in their way they think, is part and parcel of how a student should be able to be useful to the community and to themselves. Again, in order to support all this, you must have a good school policy. <laughs> okay? So in order to complement. This is our ex experience, as I said, just sharing, just to finish off. Community dialogues. We talk to our community. I have Korean students in my school, I have Japanese students, I have uh, students from India, I have students from China. You need to talk to their parents and know what's happening to them at home. And I will tell you that when you talk about philanthropy, it is not everything about money. Your services are also philanthropy. So, you must also think about your services. If we have teachers who have gone to school, currently now we are working with dialysis patients. There are many dialysis patients who can't even afford dialysis. It costs in Malaysia 130 ringgit per session and they have to do it three times a week. And if they spend 130 ringgit, their family doesn't have good food to eat for the week. So, how do you complement that? So some of them, you know what they do? We found out they don't go for dialysis because they need the money at home for food and the clothing. So we need to find out these people, this community that we live in. It's, it's not just happy and cheer for everyone. It, it is more than what you see in the, on the surface. So what we really... Well, this is what happens in our school. We get our students who are in the Rotary Club, they go and do a lot. I think Glenda has come over to our school and uh, we have shared with her what we do in our school. There are loads of activities that they do. They do car wash, they do cookie sales. Uh, in fact, my students will, uh, they go down and help uh, this deaf and, uh, deaf and uh, dumb school or mute school, uh, which is called the Silent Teddies. In the last eight years, uh, they, has been trained, they have been training our kids to make cookies. And currently, they're making cookies for Starbucks. So, these are empowerments, exposure. Kids today are shielded from philanthropy. I'm telling you this, because you can see how some of the kids are wasting food, having more than what they have. Why this element comes in? This element comes in because we are not empowering our kids at home and worse still in schools. And you know, first time I had a visit to an uh, orphanage, I had about 70 kids going to an orphanage and almost one third of them were crying when they saw the situation because they never, it, it never uh, uh, dawned on them they were kids who were three months old, abandoned and need to be looked after. So the question was running out in their head was, where are their parents? Why no one is helping them? Why others are helping them? So, can you imagine in the hearts of the kids what's happening? When they are 14 years old, the impact comes in and says, what's happening for the last 15 years? I didn't realize this. Is that what we want our kids to grow up with? When they are 20, then only they become empathy, they have the feeling of empathy? No, we got to start it from young. We got to expose them to all this in order to what I said just now. If you want our future, the future is in us. Have to empower the kids. So we do community dialogues. We do micro-projects beneficial to the needy. Uh, we started way back in helping the Nepalese earthquake. 
uh, by sending blankets. There are a lot of people who came and gave blankets. But unfortunately, when you send these blankets over to Nepal, they are not washed. <laughs> I mean, these are clean, but you know, it, it has to be washed before they could use it. So we had somebody who had a laundry and who, was, who came up and who was philanthropy enough. So we sent it all to this laundry and they cleaned it and we helped them to pack, pack it. And then, you know, these this, uh, silent teddy people worked with a lot of people uh, in the NGOs and all that and they sent it over. So these are one of the projects that, that we do. Animal shelter is another thing. Our school have adopted how many Malaysians here, please? Please put up your hands, Malaysians. Malaysians, yes, please put up. Do you know that we have a, a, a national bird? Do you know what's our national bird? We have a national flower, the hibiscus. We've got a national animal, which is the tiger. But do you know that we have a national bird? Do you know what's a national bird? Okay, it is depicted in our five ringgit uh, dollar note. It is the endangered rhinoceros hornbill. They say it is Sarawak, but actually it's not. Our national bird is a hornbill. So what we did was, many of Malaysians did not know. So what we did is our Rotary Club students, who does all this charity, are doing now research on the awareness of how many of us actually know this. You know? So uh, these are awareness. And they do projects. And then what we did was, we adopted a bird at the National Zoo. Of course, it cost us money, but we didn't just give the money like that. We went to people who became aware. So this is also animal adoption, animal shelters, abandoned animals and all that. So we also expose our kids to all these micro projects. Using these actions to demonstrate academic activities, this is what I said, what you learn in classroom, yeah? Has to be put into practice. This is another thing, private-public pu partnership, I call it PPP. We have six more schools, public schools around us. We are the only private schools. We work by sharing our facilities and all that, so we call this the private-public uh, partnership. So we rent public school halls and all that. Yeah. And innovative, innovation in new campus. January 2019, we extended our campus, one of the few campuses in Southeast Asia now, which is on a tower block, office tower block. Can you imagine a school on the 16th floor? My hall is on the 16th floor. So the, all the older kids are down there together with the pre-university program. So if you are, any one of you are in Jalan Bukit Nanas, want to come and visit our school, please come and visit. Loads of them went up there and said, I can't even imagine a school being on this office block. You know why? You can't find a piece of land, four acres in the city nowadays. They use it to build condominiums, not schools. Schools are disappearing from the cities now because of the land prices, yeah? So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being patient and listening to me. I know it's already lunchtime. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs>